Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm going to talk about the three days of darkness. And before I do, I do ask for your patience. I ask for goodwill, essentially, because I'm going to present the information that is widely available about the three days of darkness. And I'm going to ask some questions. And I think that's important because personally, and again, please, I ask for your patience if you're someone who deeply holds this private prophecy to be something that you live by, uh, because there are some consequences to following this private prophecy to its logical conclusion that do pose potential problems. And I want to address those things uh, as nicely as I can, as charitable as I, as I can. And if you're someone who's very upset by my viewpoint on this, I just ask for a little bit of understanding because I'm just trying to ask some questions here because I think the consequences of the three days of darkness prophecy, if I'm being honest, uh, if they're followed through to their logical conclusion, can pose danger to the spiritual life uh, and also just regular life in general. And I really want to explore those things. So please, I ask, I'm begging for your charity here. And I mean that, not in an annoy an annoying sense, but for real. Okay, so what is the three days of darkness? At the off chance you've never heard of the three days of darkness, which I think most people involved in traditionally minded Catholic circles or charismatic circles for that matter, will have heard of the three days of darkness. The three days of darkness essentially is a prophesied, although it's not really clear the consistency of all these prophecies, nonetheless, there are, there are a few private prophecies that do seem to correspond with one another, uh, where essentially there'll be a period of three days of darkness, literal darkness over the earth, and there will be a period of pestilence, so plague or whatever, uh, and essentially the enemies of the church will perish, and those who pray and stay in their homes and cover their windows and light a blessed candle, a beeswax candle, those people will survive. That's the meat and potatoes of it. There's a website that has the best summation of it, and I do think this website's great. I think it's called Virgo Sacrata. Um, I do think it's Sede Vacantist. Take it or leave it if you're not a Sede. I'm not a Sede. Nonetheless, it does have a lot of great traditional Catholic resources, just about various things to do with the Catholic faith, as Sedes usually are pretty good on that stuff, of course. Um, so we're going to go to that website. We're going to look at what it says. Uh, and then we're going to ask some questions. And we're also going to consider some information from Bishop Schneider, who has an opinion about this as well. So... Uh, here is the website, Three Days of Darkness, Virgo Sacrata, good website. Again, I'm not a Sede, and, but a lot of the stuff on there is great. Okay, so I'm just going to read through some of it. I want to give it the fairest shake possible so I can be objective. So, the most spectacular aspect of the act of God will be the three days of darkness over the whole earth. The three days have been announced by Catholic prophets. St. Caspar del Buffalo, Blessed Anna Maria Taigi, Blessed Elizabeth uh, Canori Mora, and Blessed Mary of Jesus Crucified. The Church does not oblige us to believe in any particular prophecy as a matter of faith, but we are indeed obliged to believe that prophecies may be made even in our own times, for this is in the Gospel. This is true. This is true. God has never punished the human race without warning us first. For this reason, from Matthew, watch ye therefore, because you know not the hour, nor day, nor the hour. Respectfully, that is appealing to the end times, nonetheless. Um, when everything seems hopeless, this is getting into the prophecies. When every, everything seems hopeless for the Christian forces, God will work a wonderful miracle, or as some prophets refer to it, a great event or a terrible event in favor of his own. During this phenomenon, the truly holy will not be harmed. And terrible, okay, I'm going to pause there for a sec. Just think about the truly holy will not be harmed, okay? And terrible though it will be, yet we may take consolation in the fact that it will mark the end of God's chastisements. It would seem that the event mentioned vaguely by so many seers is that specified by others as three days of darkness, with the sun and the moon, as it were, turning to blood. The air will be poisoned, thus killing off most of the enemies of Christ's church, during these three days, the only light available to men will be blessed candles, and one candle will burn the entire period. However, even blessed candles will not light the houses of the godless. 
Yet once the candle is lit by one in a state of grace, it will not burn out until three days, the three days darkness is over. This great event will usher in peace to the world, troubled world. It will be a sort of reenactment of the three hours of darkness over the whole earth at Christ's crucifixion and a preview of that which will mark the end of the reign of the Antichrist. This is from a book called, you can click a link here, uh, The Prophets and Our Times. It's not loading from the archive, can be slow. There it is. So it's from a book, The Prophets and Our Times, uh, by a priest, and it did have an imprimatur. Okay. Now, let's just pause there for a second. Um, that this book has an imprimatur is important. Uh, of course, it's not heretical, you know. So the three days of darkness being in this book summarized, this means that it's not heretical. So no one who believes in the three days of darkness is a heretic. And that's what an imprimatur really means. An imprimatur on a book does not mean that the thing in and of itself is binding on the faithful, far from it. Uh, the writings of mystics and things like that often have imprimaturs because when they look in the books themselves, they say, well, there's nothing here that is against the Catholic faith. Therefore, there's, there poses no danger to Catholic orthodoxy by believing this in the explicit sense. So it's, it's, it's imprimatur. Now, an imprimatur is also not infallible, far from it. Um, there have been examples in the past of bishops putting imprimaturs on certain things, and those things turned out to be not so good, and that's a whole other conversation. Nonetheless, this has an imprimatur. There's nothing in that that is heretical. There's nothing wrong with believing that. There's nothing wrong with, with that being something someone could hold privately. Okay. Now, in the scriptures, we do find references to days of darkness. Uh, here is a reference to Exodus. You probably know the story of the sun going away and Moses with the Pharaoh and all this kind of stuff. Uh, Isaiah, there's a prophecy there. Uh, now, Isaiah is probably a prefigurement of Christ because that's where we find Isaiah. Uh, in Joel, uh, it says, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Uh, Matthew, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall be the sun. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, etc., etc., etc. So these are all references to things that definitely, if we're being honest, could, it could lead to uh, some sort of uh, three days of darkness prophecy parallel. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, here is three days of darkness told by Our Lady to Mary Julie Jehenny, uh, the Breton stigmatist. And it says, uh, Blessed Anna Marie, uh, Anna Maria Taigi predicted a major as of yet still forthcoming chastisement for the world on account of its grave sins. Now, I do want to just pause there quickly. And this is kind of going to go into... It's very sunny for me right now. Sorry if the sun coming through, it's making it bright. Um, talk of chastisement. You need to understand... We need, as Catholics, we need to understand that the worst type of chastisements that we can ever receive are not necessarily physical. And this is going to get into where I think problems come with the three days of darkness belief as a sort of day fide thing that we live by because it does insist on the physical more than anything. People will say, you know, a big chastisement's coming and they're, they're expecting that things will happen in the flesh. But if we read the gospel, Christ is constantly hammering home against the Pharisees that they're understanding things in a carnal sense and not in a spiritual sense. Okay. The greatest chastisement that could ever befall the human race, according to saints like jo St. John Eudes, is bad priests. Um, a chastisement is a punishment, okay? Um, the anguish from us, from a chastisement of, of living in an immoral culture, living in a culture that's lost its reason and sense, I mean, this is a greater punishment than a tidal wave or a tsunami because it pertains to, as Christ would say, fear not that which can kill the body, but fear, that, fear him who can kill the soul. This is, I think there needs to be an interpretive key for Catholics where they stop looking for, um, you know, bullets are flying, trees are falling over, lightning is striking houses. This is the chastisement. That could very well happen. And there is an aspect of, of physical things taking place at the end of the world for sure. 
But as far as chastisements that have befallen the human race, the worst thing that could ever happen would be a spiritual thing. And it's important to keep that in mind. This is what, according to the, um, the Three Days of Darkness, God will send two punishments. One will be in the form of wars, revolutions, and other evils that shall originate on earth. The other will be sent from heaven. There shall come over the whole earth an intense darkness, lasting three days and three nights. Nothing can be seen, and the air which will be laden with pestilence, which will claim mainly but not only the enemies of religion. It will be impossible to use any man-made light, etc., etc., bless candles. Okay, this is just a summation of what we just read. All the enemies of the church, whether known or unknown, will perish over the whole earth during that universal darkness, with the exception of a few whom God will soon convert. The air shall be infected by demons who will appear under all sorts of hideous forms. The three days of darkness will be on a Thursday, Friday, and a Saturday, days of the Most Holy Sacrament and of the Cross and Our Lady. Three days less one night, so I guess two nights. And Our Lady said... According to this private prophecy, the earth will be covered in darkness and hell will be loosed on earth. The thunder and lightning will cause those who have no faith or trust in my power to die of fear. During these three days of terrifying darkness, no windows must be opened because no one will be able to see the earth and the terrible color it will have in those days of punishment without dying at once. So if you look out your window, you die. The sky will be on fire. The earth will be split. During these three days of darkness, let the blessed candle be lighted everywhere. No other light will shine. Continues uh, another prophecy, private prophecy, by the way. These are not binding on Catholics. No one outside a shelter will survive. The earth will shake as that the judgment and fear will be great. Yes, we will listen to the prayers of your friends. No one, not one will perish. We will need them to publish the glory of the cross. Another one, the candles of blessed wax alone will give light during this horrible darkness. One candle alone will be enough for the duration of this night of hell. In the homes of the wicked and blasphemers, these candles will have no light. Okay, there's many more things like this. Now, there is a reference to Padre Pio. Keep your windows well covered. Do not look. And also, Padre Pio, again, wonderful, not infallible. There are, uh, yeah, not infallible. Keep your windows well covered. Do not look out. Light a blessed candle, which will suffice for many days. Pray the rosary. Read spiritual books. Make acts of spiritual communion. Also acts of love, which are so pleasing to us. Pray with outstretched arms or prostrate on the ground in order that many souls may be saved. Do not go outside the house. Provide yourself with sufficient food. The powers of nature shall be moved and a rain of fire shall make people tremble with fear. Have courage. I am in the midst of you. Okay. So it goes on how to prepare, have blessed candles, and so forth. This it really is the, the most comprehensive. Well, I wasn't even sharing it on the screen. I apologize. Uh, this is the most comprehensive website when it comes to this stuff. I apologize. I should have shared that. Um, okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So let's just break this down for a second here. Actually, first, I'm actually going to show you Bishop Schneider, because I did do a show on this a while ago, and Bishop and I have the comment here queued up from Bishop Schneider. I want to just play this again for those who never saw this episode, because this is important. Now, here's Bishop Schneider talking about the three days of darkness. Pray in small groups about the three days of darkness. Would Bishop Schneider address this, please, and give us clear directions on how we should prepare for this event I have many blessed candles. However, my friends say they have to be bees wax in order to last all three days. What will these three days lead up to? This is not a prophecy. Uh, I recognize the prophecy of the church. Uh, we, must, we must not uh, accept this so-called three dark days as a truth. We don't know if this is true or not. We have no guarantee. We cannot take this as something sure, because the church gives not does not give us a guarantee of this. It can be also a deception. We have to be very careful today. With so many prophecies and revelations, uh, this is also a tactic of the devil to spread ever more confusion among the good Catholics with this continuous 
phenomenon of apparitions. And we have to be very sober. And we don't need these apparitions in this case, only when the church seriously examined and approved. And so therefore, I, I, I personally don't believe in that, that, that this is true, what is said about these really so-called dark days. And we have not to be so, in some way, materialistic, egoistic, to, to only to have for me candles and food and so on, to all, to, to, how do you say, to, to the, for me only, or from, this is, this is a very narrow, materialistic, egoistic view. We have to trust in God when there will come a, a distress and a trial, persecution, God will provide always for his children, even the necessary material needs. And we have not to think, as Jesus said, what we have to rest, what we have to eat. Jesus said, these are doing the pagan. Or your father knows what you need. And when we are really believing in the law and trusting in him, and, and we, when we are seeking first the kingdom of God, the faith, and then God will not abandon us. This was a demonstration of all the history of the church, of the saints and the Catholic families. This was my experience in the Soviet Union. My parents, they were almost dying from, from starvation, from hunger in the camps. And God provided for them. Because they trusted in God, we have to trust in the law. Okay, so there's a few things there that are super important that Bishop Schneider said. The first one, it's not a teaching of the church. That's really important. That's really, really important. It's not, it is not a teaching of the church. It's not part of the teachings of the church. Not only is it not de fide, which this website rightly says, meaning it's not of the divine faith, like, you know, believing in the resurrection or something like that. But it's not even in the same universe as that. It's not even, a, it's, not, it's not a teaching in any sense. It's not a common opinion. And you should look up the, the levels of dogma. My friend Tim Flanders at his website, Meaning of Catholic, if you just look up theological notes, levels of dogma, uh, by Tim Flanders. You'll find it. It's a great... Actually, you know what? Maybe I should just bring that up just to be fair here. So if I look up uh, Theological Notes, Tim Flanders. So here's Tim's website. I'm just going to show this because this is important. So uh, you have different levels of... This is the, the general consensus for you know how theologians talk about these things. So you have de fide, which is, and it's right here, it's of the faith, meaning it's something that is, you know, necessarily believed, explicitly defined by the highest authority. Example, all who die in mortal sin will suffer hell for all eternity. Uh, denial of any of these truths is the sin of heresy. De fide ecclesiastica, defined by the church. It's implicit in scripture and tradition, for example, the assumption of Mary. Sententia fide proxima, teaching is generally understood by theologians as explicit in tradition, but not explicitly defined. But still, uh, denial of these truths is the sin of error proximate, mortal sin, approximate to heresy. Sententia certa, theologically certain, implicit in scripture and tradition, not explicitly defined by the church. Denial of these truths without a grave reason is the mortal sin of error against the faith. So, for example, the primary purpose of matrimony is the generation of children, the secondary purpose is the mutual help and regulation of lust. Sententia communis. Uh, example, willful sins against the sixth commandment are always mortal sins. It is licit to object to these teachings if and only if there is good reason. To object to any without good reason is the mortal sin of temerity. And then there's senten 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 sententia probabilis. And these are probable teaching, well-founded on good authority, yet is open to question pious beliefs and tolerated opinions also fall under this note and have the lowest degree of certainty. For example, Jesus received, or G Jesus, Judas received Holy Communion at the Last Supper. Denial of these teachings is licit, provided piety is given to legitimate authority. So, these are the, this is, 
these are what teachings of the church are as far as like, and that's a fast crash course, but I just wanted to show that. The point being is private prophecy of this type has nothing to do with any of these things. It's, it's not even in the realm of a church teaching. There is a way that private prophecy is something that we could say approaches a level of you must believe this or you're an idiot if you don't as far as the church is concerned. And that does pertain to certain things like Fatima. And I'll show you a quick example of that. So here is an article from Dr. Kwasniewski. You have to be a paid subscriber to read this article. I recommend you do. Go to Tradition Insanity, traditionsanity.substack.com. I love his stuff. It's my favorite. Um, he does go over how there is a legitimate type of private revelation, which is, it is it's a big deal. And in here he talks about, uh, so he says, it is a commonplace, it is a commonplace, it is commonplace in many spiritual, dogmatic, and moral theology manuals that those to whom a prophecy or counsel is directed have an obligation to act upon it. Some modern priests and theologians, in contrast, basically dismiss such private revelation as merely optional. Who is right? And he goes on to show that it is the case that if someone is convinced that something is an a legitimate private prophecy that is directed to them, I'm not going to read the whole thing, that they should act on it. And he shows a, num a numerous amount of, of, of things, especially Dogmatic Theology by Van Nord. That's extremely important. That's an amazing uh, resource. Um, and he goes to Thomas Aquinas. And again, so yes, there is a re uh, an aspect. And here is a Lateran Council. I I'm not going to read all these because, you know, there's a lot here to read. Um and, but here's an important caveat that he gives. Does this risk, does this approach risk turning private revelations into public revelation? So be, basically, are we going to put this stuff on the same realm as the scriptures? And he says, someone might object that our argument has in effect turned a private revelation into a public one, but that objection rests on an equivocation. And here he quotes Father William Most. Father Most is an amazing theologian. Some private revelations of our own times, such as those of Fatima, are directed to all Christians, not only to one individual. Still, they are technically called private to distinguish them from that revelation which closed with the death of St. John. On this point, uh, he says, we have to distinguish between those revelations made to individuals for their own good and those made to the whole church. Fatima, Lourdes, and Guadalupe certainly fall in the latter category, given the miraculous events surrounding them, which are evidence of the divine. These seem to call for a greater commitment on the part of Catholics as a whole, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he quotes Eric Ibarra here, who is great. And he says, educated Catholics have always distinguished between public revelation and private, and moreover, hold that private revelation is of benefit precisely because it brings back to mind and underlines in a specific way truths already taught in sacred scripture. Uh, okay. So, I'm not discounting so-called private prophecy and private revelation out of hand. I'm not doing that at all. It's actually, it's, 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 it's clear that uh, if something is directed to the whole church in a way that is proven by miracles, it is investigated, you know, it becomes uh, obvious that, that this thing is true and, and attested to time and time again by the legitimate authorities, you know, the way that you look at apparitions and things. If that happens, then that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Fatima's like that. Guadalupe is like that. The Immaculate Conception to Saint uh, Bernadette's like that. La Salette's like that. I mean, there's there's some there's some prophecies out there, revelations and so forth, which we don't just say, oh, it's just private. No, we're fools if we do that. But the three days of darkness prophecies, they don't fall under that category. They don't even approach that category. They just simply don't. What we have is we have, we have various testimonies of various mystics who see certain things that seem consistent with what we find in Scripture and so forth, and that's it. It's, it, is, it does not approach a teaching of the church. It does not approach anything binding on the faithful. It doesn't even approach any of the lowest levels of dogma. It's not even in the same ballpark. So you got to ask yourself, like, is that really what we think about how God acts? Because if we're if we're comparing the three days of darkness thing to the the similar things in the Old Testament with 
Moses and, and the Pharaoh and things. Well, that was obvious because it was accompanied by signs and wonders. And God does do those sorts of things in the history of Revelation and in the post apostolic age with certain things, again, like Fatima, etc. That does happen. But the three days of darkness, these prophecies, it doesn't, there's nothing like that whatsoever. It's not as if, you know, the three days of darkness was prophesied to so-and-so and, -so and uh, it was accompanied by some grand, huge miracle that was then investigated and there were seers. Nothing like that even comes close. So if we're going to act on something that has a lot of consequences to it, and it's not even approaching anything binding on the Catholic faithful, and again, not just de fide, anything. It's not, a, it's not a teaching in any way of the church. Do we really think, because the consequences of the three days of darkness are huge. I mean, you know, if people out there who think I'm an idiot for not putting all my, my, my stock in this, well, I'm going to be ripped to shreds by demons if I go to the grocery store when the sun goes out. That's the logic of it. That's a, I mean, literally, I mean, okay, there are how many Catholics on earth? A billion and a half? There are, I don't know, a few hundred thousand maybe, maybe a million throughout the world. I don't know. Let's call it five million. There are five million Catholics in the world who take this seriously. I'm just ballparking here. Maybe it's 20 million, whatever. Just use the number five million. There's a few million people who take this number seriously, this prophecy seriously, who have like big, huge boards for their windows ready to go. Uh, they've got blessed candles. Uh, they've got their food ready. They've got their prepper thing going. They've got a three days of darkness. Get, let's call it five million people. Well, are all of those five million people going to be in a state of grace when this thing happens? Maybe. Let's just say, let's just say eighty percent of them are. Because believing in private prophecy is not synonymous with being holy. Because many people believe in private prophecy, and in fact, if you look into a lot of the New Age people, they love the three days of darkness thing. They they it's a big deal in like the channeling community and stuff. So let's just say. 80%. So that's 4 million Catholics are going to be in a state of grace. So basically, out of the 8 billion people on earth, 99.9% .9 are going to be killed by demons and plague in three days. And 4 million or so will be left. If it were to happen tomorrow. And we have no warning other than private prophecies that don't even approach, that don't even hint at being a teaching of the church. So the most insane, calamitous, destructive, deadly, vile, violent event in human history up to this point, except for the flood, there will be no warning for that from any legitimate church authority. Yet the, 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 the salvation of the world the, the continuation of the human race depends on this. That is just simply not how these things work in the church. It's just not. We do know there will be an end times. We do know there will be great calamities at the end of the world. This is in the scriptures. This is part of the teaching of the church. This is attested by the apostles and the, and the, and the prophet. Like this is, this is clear and obvious part of the Catholic faith in the catechisms. We need to believe this. Even the new catechism, it's very clear that the end of the world, the, you know, the church will pass through some time of great calamity and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's very, very clear. We have ample warning. It's in the scriptures. It's in the teaching of the church. It's in all the catechisms. It's, it, it's, it is part of the Catholic faith. There is no ignorance to this. But even the, but even the uh, prophecies about the end times, survival of that does not depend on having a blessed candle and boarding up your windows. We know there'll be the reign of the Antichrist and so forth, but there's no physical thing we can get. There's no, you know, talisman, r lucky rabbit's foot that we can have that's going to save us from that. And here's where certain issues fall, greater issues in my opinion. 
I mean, this idea that you, if you light a candle and you board up your windows, that everyone else, 99.9% .9 of human beings are going to perish because they're ripped to shreds by demons. And you're going to survive because of a candle. And this candle is going to be lit for three days, etc. I mean, this is, this is honestly more like superstition or magic than it is Catholicism. It's not part of the teachings of the church. And it also requires a basically a superstitious belief in the power of a single blessed candle in a way that seems very un-Catholic. Furthermore, the idea is that after this, there's going to be some sort of restoration. I mean, how? I mean, you're going to lose. I mean, how many corpses will be in the world? I mean, how literally think about that. Just think about the logistics of that. You'll have 7.9 billion people will die of plague and demon attacks. So the world is literally covered in rotting corpses. Most of the priests of the world will die because most priests don't believe in this because no one's required to. And many priests, even if they're relatively faithful, they're not going to take this seriously. All of the, everything's going to be just, it's, it's like the planet of the apes or something. <laughs> like there'll be no one left. And this is the restoration. I mean, this is, this, this, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And the idea that, you know, again, it comes back to this. It, 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 there's something to this that is, is like a belief in the rapture or something. It's the idea that something terrible is going to happen to the world, but I'm going to be okay. Does that really match a Catholic sensibility? I mean, I'm, I'm being honest. Does that really match a Catholic sensibility about how Catholics view suffering? Because if there is a time of intense and incredible suffering, Catholics have never had a guarantee they're not going to go through it. I mean, with the revelations about the end times, all these sorts of things, I mean, there's no guarantee Catholics won't suffer. And in fact, you will suffer the most if you are a, a, a Catholic during the end times because you'll be persecuted and killed and executed and whatever. Catholics, by... by by the very nature of being a Catholic, never escape persecution. We're always persecuted. That's kind of the point. So when a chastisement befalls the world, we suffer the most because it's meant to sanctify us and to bring us to heaven. It's not, it's not a purposeless chastisement. So all of these enemies that have no warning are just going to be wiped out by God with re no real chance for conversion and just sent to hell. And the Catholics who already believe are going to be fine because they huddle in their living rooms with tinfoil over their windows and a candle. I mean, I'm serious for people. Have you really thought this thing through all the way? And you're going to live your life on this and you're going to put your claims in this. And it has no backing from any church authority in any real way. And imprimatur does not mean a teaching of the church. There are plenty of things that are imp have imprimaturs and are not binding. So really, what is the three days of darkness about? I mean, I think I've kind of hammered home enough here. What is it really about? At the end of the day, I mean, these are mystics. I mean, you can't eat. I was talking to my wife about, you know, we were talking about reading the Bible, and she was talking about how it's so difficult to read the scriptures without an interpretive key from a church father and so forth, because a lot of the stuff you look in the Bible and you go, what does that even mean? The grammar can be strange. The images can be strange. The typology makes no sense unless you know what it's fulfilled in. I mean, it's very difficult to read the scriptures without, without a guide. Which is why personally, see, the Satan's not happy. The Lord of the flies, Beelzebub, is bugging me right now with this fly in my house. Um, um, this is why, you know, as important as it is, I think the Dewey Reims is a great translation, of course. Uh, but the most important thing when reading the Bible is really the, the commentary. You know, if you read the Revised Standard Version or something, okay, maybe people can quibble about differences which are not unessential. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is the commentary. Uh, because that's where you get into the weeds. But in any event, um, so mystics... First of all, mystics are not scripture. Mystics do not have the, 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 the sort of universal application the way that scripture does or, or revelations like Fatima that have been vetted to the highest degree. Um, 
And mystics use mystical language, and mystical language is mysterious. So when we read these prophecies, I mean, to take these prophecies literally as if this is what God requires in a few writings from a few mystics of the thousands of mystics, none of it approved by the church for any universal application, to think that these mystics would require of us or expect us to live by this as if 99.9% .9 of the human race was going to be exterminated and their corpses were going to rot on the streets and we could survive this because of tinfoil over our windows and a candle? There's no possible way, in my opinion, Padre Pio, Anna Maria Taiji, etc. I, I think there's no possible way they expect this, expected this to be believed as some sort of thing that was for the salvation of the human race. Mystical writings appeal to the spiritual. So, you know, a great calamity, a darkness over the earth, you know, don't look outside, pray your rosary, hold close to the flame of your baptism, to the blessed candle that you receive. I mean, these are what make more sense. Yes, there are chastisements. We're living through a chastisement right now. How difficult is it to be Catholic? You're persecuted for your faith and your place of work. You have to hold fast. You can't look out your windows. You can't look at the screens. You can't look at the world. You know, you have to avoid the worldliness because if you do, you're going to lose your soul if you don't avoid it. I mean, these are the readings of these prophecies that make perfect sense spiritually and are consistent with basic holiness for Catholics and have nothing to do with avoiding a super plague of demons and pestilence in the air because you board up your windows and light a candle. I'm sorry, but the three days of darkness as a literal belief has literally no backing in t church teaching in any binding way, any way even approaching it, and the logic of it is, in my opinion, absurd. 99.9% .9 and, and again, it's, it's very much like a rapture. It's all the bad people are going to be destroyed and I'm going to be okay. That again, doesn't even really match what we are to believe as Catholics. When we, when the antichrist comes, we are not going to escape the persecution. That's the point. The world's going to be filled with martyrs and those who do follow the antichrist are going to be just fine until Christ comes back. They're going to have prosperity. They're going to have worldly peace. They're going to be totally fine. They're going to live an awesome life, just like people today. If you just reject the laws of God and you follow what the, the woke mob wants you to do, and you have your porn and you have your drugs and you have your contraception, you can go live a nice cushy life where you don't suffer at all, assistance in dying, whatever. You can go live that life, but then you go to hell. So it's really the opposite. If you follow the laws of God, you suffer physically. And if you don't follow the laws of God, you don't suffer physically. You don't suffer persecution, but you lose your soul. Whereas the three days of darkness is, if you follow the laws of God, nothing bad happens to you. And if you don't follow the laws of God, you get destroyed by demons and pestilence. That's like prophecy, fantasy, fan fiction. That's not like what the end times will be like. And it's not like what the lives of Catholics have ever been like. And the consequences of living with this three days of darkness as a, as a way of living your life, I mean, there's no way you're going to, I mean, this is going to be something that's going to cause you a lot of anxiety. I mean, what happens if you're at the grocery store and the three days of darkness hits? You're not home with your blessed candle. You're going to die. What happens if you're out for a walk in the woods and boom, three days of darkness hits? What's going to happen to you? You don't have your blessed candle. You can't close your eyes. The demons are acting, the people are, the demons are dressed as people that you know and they're fooling you and stuff. Come with me and you're destroyed. Plus there's a plague. What happens if your kids are at school when the three days of darkness hits? Boom, you're done. All because you weren't in your house with a blessed candle and didn't have tinfoil over your windows? That is magical superstition that is not Catholicism. That is simply not Catholicism. Even Christ, he tells us that when the end times are here, there will be signs that they're coming. Certain things we'll know. But with the three days of darkness? Everyone you know and love who has lived their whole life to be in a state of grace, follow the laws of God, go to confession, pray their rosary, 
if they just happen to be on a cruise ship or on a plane or whatever, and the three days of darkness hits and they don't have a blessed candle, it's ripped apart by demons and destroyed by a plague. I'm sorry, but that's insane. That, that's not Catholic. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.